All right. Welcome to the Zero E Michigan podcast. Carl's out on the motorcycle, so he encouraged me to try to do a solo. I got Walter here from the Network Architecture, and we're going to discuss um, the Fisker saga, I guess. Is that a, a good uh, way to put it? And, and then just the numbers with Tesla. Yeah, tons of stuff going on. It's been a very interesting week. Uh, lots of downturns, but as you say, it's been a very interesting saga. Right, right. So I know for me, I've always been a fan of the, we'll go with the Fisker first. I right. don't know how many people have seen the very first Fisker that came out. It looks similar to the Model S, but better looking, if you can imagine that. I like the Model S. It had a solar roof, so the, it was like, you know, kind of curvy, and it had panels in it. And it just looked so cool. He did such a good job. But what I heard was he used to be an engineer for GM. And uh, he, guess, couldn't get the numbers with them, whatever, some personality conflict. So he partnered up with Volvo, and that wound up being the motor. And Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm getting this mixed up. That is, that is the DeLorean story. And okay. the Fisker story is similar. Yeah. So that was the DeLorean story. And then I don't know for sure if it's, you know, he wasn't the DeLorean guy was the engineer with GM. And then they put that motor in it. It just ruined the car. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, I think, with the Fisker. Whoever he partnered up with, it, it wasn't a good choice. And that motor was problematic and electronics were problematic with the car. So yeah. anyways, the reason, I, the reason I bring that up, and it's just a real generic view from my end. Um, I was talking to Walter earlier, uh, just to keep my bandwidth, like, I, I just have to, you know, focus. And right now, it's either going to be a Tesla Model Y or the F-150 Lightning is one of the two future purchases for me. And so that's pretty much all I'm focusing on. So the loose, I got a friend that actually wor is working at the Lucid plant in Arizona. And so I'm hearing stuff from there, but I still, I'm just not, I'm not researching anything on Lucid. And same thing with the Fisker. And I, I, I also the, the Ocean, the new one out, it's a good looking vehicle. And, and I mean, initially I was like, did they partner up with Ford? Cause that looks like the new Ford, you know, that they were releasing in Europe, right? The electric did you notice that the at escape? all? I think it's called well, an escape. Is it the one, the electric, the, the little four-door electric they released in, in Europe? But yeah. Working around yeah, it looks very similar to the Fisker Ocean. You're right. Yeah, so I was like, hey, maybe they've got, you know. But anyways, with that being said, that's what my first thought was, was like, man, Fisker really struggled with, you know, relationships and getting that put together. So I was always a little skeptical because of their first release, right? Like the guy's an amazing designer, but I think that next level, right? And, and man, I think that's a challenge, right? To try to find powertrain partner. What's your thought? Yeah. So I love the way that you described it as a parallel to the DeLorean breakout story, because, you know, it's been the big three and uh, major automakers kind of dominating the industry. And it was near impossible for an independent person to kind of show up. And DeLorean tried to, and he was successful for a while. And the Fisker saga, as you say, is very similar. So I definitely like the way that that's um, that you uh, mentioned that at the beginning. It's uh, unfortunate, from what I understand, now in the age of EVs, the ability to do one of these breakout uh, attempts from the cookie-cutter approach of major automotive is a bit more doable because people were looking for compelling electric vehicles and the major automakers were just not making them. So people like Tesla, and you mentioned Lucid also, had an opportunity to get in there and start making compelling electric vehicles that people like and enjoy. I know that for me, uh, I just like the ability to have a car that doesn't leak oil is <laughs> really it, man. I don't like waking up on a Tuesday morning to mystery fluid on the floor of my garage and then having to spend three days at a mechanic for them to tell me $400 to get my car back. 
three days later or something like that. Right, right. So electric cars are just more reliable. And so I do like that. So no one was making them except, you know, Tesla and Lucid and uh, I guess Rivian for a while. And so Fisker had a window of opportunity to do something similar with the breakout um, path that had been blazed by those other three. And my understanding of what happened is unlike Tesla, which was very vertically integrated, they like to make all the parts and do the machining themselves. Fisker was just basically like a Sears Roebuck catalog collection right. of, of components. And they did a little bit of design, but I think it was a Magna powertrain built in Europe on the assembly lines that were already set up there. And they just purchased the components and uh, provided some oversight with the design and the thing started rolling off the assembly line. And um, pretty much just a a la carte, uh, choose your component approach to electric vehicle, which is the exact opposite from what Tesla did. Um, and so with very little capital, they didn't need any factories. They, as you say, just garnered their relationships and um, got to the point of actually producing vehicles. And I know a lot of people out there, not a lot, but I know several people out there who've been producing YouTube content who are Fisker Ocean owners. And they just started to release content probably in the past uh, three months or so. And it was a great underdog story to see because, it, as you say, it looks like a great car. You know, it's roomy. It's not like low to the ground. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of getting up there in years, and I don't like the low yeah. to the ground option anymore. I kind of like to scoop my butt in sideways instead of dipping down. And uh, yeah. so it, it was a roomy car, and um, it seemed to be engineered well. As you say, there were lingering software bug problems, but with any new product, I suppose that's to be expected. And I uh, figured that eventually it would just start working itself out. Um, and then we started to hear about some severe financial problems leading to it being delisted off the New York Stock Exchange. It's a bit of an uh, anomaly that they were able to get listed on the New York Stock Exchange because that's the Blue Blood Stock Exchange versus the NASDAQ, which is really where you normally see tech startups uh, come from, but he was on the New York Stock Exchange and unfortunately got uh, delisted and uh, right now is in the throes of determining final steps, whether or not they will do a reorg or uh, s just call it quits and try to uh, recollect his, his thoughts and move on elsewhere. Right. I was just listening to one where they, one guy talking that he got the car and the values have just dropped, right? Uh, um, I guess like uh, he, he mentioned that GM with the Blazer, they were having so much trouble. They're off on a $5,000 refund if you had bought one. And so they were like, man, Fisker's gonna have to like cough up 20 grand because you know the, they've dropped so bad in value. So that's really unfortunate for the early adopters of that. Yeah, and I heard um, that they even went down to $25,000 for the ocean just to empty their inventory in a last desperate attempt to survive. And uh, we'll see if that um, pans out. I even heard today that uh, Mr. Fisker, who had a large mansion in California, put it up for sale. And the speculation is he's going to try to use that money to keep the company afloat and keep production going for a little bit longer. Uh, we're not sure if that's wow. actually his intention, but... Uh, we did see that his uh, large property purchased from uh, stock sale has now been put on the market. And if he was thinking of just calling it quits, you would think he would keep that property. But um, it right. looks like he, he may be trying to keep the place afloat for as long as possible. So we'll see what happens. We haven't heard anything, I mean, about, bank we haven't heard anything about bankruptcy, so we c we're yeah. kind of expecting that to happen. And all of a sudden, no news is probably good news at this point. I mean, I would, like you said earlier, uh, uh, you know, voting for the little guy yeah, and, you know, some backstory kind of thing. So I'm, I'm with you. I, I'd love to, I hope he can pull it off. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I was a fan. And, and even if, if, if things always line up, I see those, the very first Fisker karma, maybe, um, you'll see him around. If one came, I would want to, you know, you'd have to pull the motor out and, you know, kind of do a, 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 I believe it was even a, a, a hybrid of sorts, right? So it was like the, like the Volt. Hmm. 
now that I think about it. Anyway, so may, maybe it would be better to do like grab the all the, the Tesla, which seems to be the most popular when you're going to re-power a car. Anyways, I haven't thought much about it. I mean, I did have a phone call with a friend. We saw one in an auction and we kicked the idea around, but that's as far, you know, we're like, oh man, it's got all kinds of electrical problems and the, the motor's got issues. And so we're like, it's such a good looking car though. But anyways. Yeah, the one problem still, also, if, if they do go south, would be the serviceability and getting spare parts should it break down. Because if it does collapse, then you basically have a car that is only as good as its next breakdown because once it breaks down it'll be near impossible to get parts for it unless magna somehow has a way of sourcing uh spare parts for the cars that they built i'm not quite sure yeah i wonder i i i, I that name doesn't even sound familiar so i'm wondering is that like part of a european or is that it is yes yeah, a european um manufacturer and they they do white label builds for many different things and that's where from what i understood the uh, factory was that the fisker ocean was getting made out of so he just so got yeah that a, would a basic be platform and then he built the car on top yeah. of the basic platform like uh there's another guy so I, I i don't know if you know i rebuild wreck cars right oh i didn't know and that, so no. all my bolts are um i have two that are salvage title two that are clear title and uh and Three of them have been in, you know, serious accidents where they wouldn't even run. Um, uh, although in a Volt, the minute an airbag is ignited, then it it kicks the computer code so it won't start. And then you have to go back. And I finally, after, I think like on my sixth one, my one buddy has, uh, has a computer snap-on. And so you got to go through and shake hands with all the modules then it clears and allows it to start. So I finally figured out how to do it on my own, but GM charges you 400 bucks. So it's, it's reasonable hmm. to, you know, to take it and do that. But anyways, my point being is, uh, so another guy that does rec rebuilds, he did a, I think it was a Austin is Austin Martin. And he was able to get BMW. They use a lot of BMW parts in it. If hmm. I remember right. So, uh, and then another guy was doing uh, uh, maybe a McLaren and he was able to use Nissan parts like for the injectors or something. So anyways, it's known out there, right? That that you can take the parts number and go look and it turns out, oh, that's other what Nissan. Yeah, other manufacturers using the same part. Yeah. Right, right. And it seems like uh, the GM of Europe was, was it Saab or... Man, that sounds I right. Can't think. Yeah. Anyways, they're one of the companies who are a lot bigger than what I thought. They're you know they're small here, but they have a big footprint, and they were like the GM of Europe. I know when I was in Australia, uh, Holden was the GM of Australia, and it was so funny because uh, if you remember the movie Mad Max, mm -hmm. you know you're looking at the car he's driving, you're like, oh, that's the Mach One, and then as it drives by, you're like, no, no, that's a '69 Chevelle, right? The rear quarter, the front grille was a six was the Mach 1, the rear quarters, the Chevelle. So yeah, a lot of cars that like, it was funny. Hmm. But anyways, yeah, interesting. So hopefully, hopefully they can pull that off. Yeah, we're, um, in, we're, we're in a time now where it seems as though with no bankruptcy announcement, the answer is they're continuing until they're told they can't. So we'll see what happens. Maybe it'll be a quiet success story, come back from the grave sort of thing. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? That'd hmm. be great. All right, so then now we're just the, the numbers with Tesla was another topic that we thought we would, where where are you on that? Yeah, so it could be dissected many different ways. The major storyline seems to be that because Tesla is the market leader and their numbers are dipping, that it means that all EVs are losing popularity across the entire market. So people are losing interest in EVs as a concept because Tesla is going down. Uh, and then there's another question that, it, no, it's just actually the Tesla brand, which has started to erode a little bit. And honestly, I don't do market research, so I can't really answer that question. I can say that as a observer, when you have the CEO of a company dropping F-bombs on a live mic, <laughs> you can only do that so many times before eventually it starts to wear into the brand. Um, 
So there's that unfortunate aspect. Uh, the product is solid. I used to be a Tesla owner and I had no problems whatsoever. Um, I love the fact that when you look in the manual to see when your first service schedule is, they say there is none. Enjoy your car. Yep. Um, now, obviously, you got to replace the uh, tires every 40,000 miles. And um, you got to look at serviceability of the brake pads at about 80,000 miles, somewhere around there. But, you know, there's people on YouTube who have been driving their Teslas for a very long time and have not had any service issues whatsoever and are in the 80,000, 100,000 dollars. 100,000 mile range. Um, I saw one video where someone was in Europe who got an early Tesla Model S and they were 300,000 kilometers in. Uh, now, he did have to drop the battery pack and have it replaced uh, once or twice, but it was under warranty, so he didn't have to pay anything. Just a very solid car, so I never had any complaints about the product. And without question, the gold standard for EV charging is the supercharger network. It's ubiquitous, right. it's the gas station experience, it's seamless, touchless, contactless pay system that's all done in the back end, so you just show up and plug in. Um, and so all those things are great aspects of Tesla as a brand. So the brand is fine. Um, and I would have to say that there might be some erosion of electric vehicles as a whole that is starting to eat into Tesla. There's also competition from China. There's um, some erosion of the Tesla brand, as I said, as a result of the somewhat erratic behavior, I guess is a way of describing it, of the CEO. And um, a couple of misses, the Cybertruck had a lot of hype around the 4680 cell that didn't really pan out. And they over-promised and under-delivered on the Cybertruck. So there was a little bit of, um, of uh, deflation from the high expectations uh, for that. So I think all those things combined are just kind of causing a bit of a sag. We're in an election year and uh, the politics are, there's a lot of anti-EV politics being vocalized out there as well. So um, And the high inflation, right? That's not helping. High inflation also, yeah. And, um, but we can't ignore that there are other EV brands that are doing better than ever. Hyundai, um, the Chevrolet um, lineup, the Silverado is getting really good reviews. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to bring that up, that that truck they did a, uh, out of spec did where they took the, the Rivian, the Lightning, the Cyber Silverado truck. and the, and the Cybertruck. Yeah. And so the, the Silverado won, won. even won. without being able to use the, the the tesla yeah. network but but the ford was able to charge right on the tesla mm -hmm. network yep and then, so are have you are you able to use your gm now is it is it coming up when no, when will boy, you charge your cadillac i'm really waiting and we're waiting to hear apparently because um you know how i mentioned that in tesla you just plug right in and it starts yeah. charging that plug in charge feature there's two different standards actually one is called ISO 1511.8, which is what Tesla uses, and Electrify America. But GM partners with EVgo, which uses a different standard um, uh -oh. called Auto Charge Plus. So the GM vehicles don't have that ability to just plug right into a Tesla supercharger and start charging because they'll full, first have to have a um, software upgrade in order to, for that to work. And on the Chevrolet Volt, that will never happen. They just don't have the ability to do plug and charge whatsoever. So what I'm hearing is that very soon, GM vehicles will be added to the supercharger network without plug and charge. You'll have to use the app. So you'll go into your phone and you'll initiate the charge through the app. Um, okay. So I'm hearing very soon, and I actually was just in the Tesla app today, and the Chevrolet Bolt, Bolt is in fact already there. So... Okay. It's, but not a, it's not working yet, but at least the car is there as a selection. The Bolt, B-O-L-T. B-O-L-T is there, yes. And what about your Cadillac? Not yet. Um, so I guess the indication is there that we're waiting for the final integration to complete. And um, I should be saying the Lyric, right? It More. is a Lyric. Um, that's the only electric Cadillac. Um, so there's a couple other ones coming out. There's the Optic, there's the Escalade IQ, 
uh, the Lyric, the Celestic. If you want to spend three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, that one's available. <laughs> what is that going to be? What is that? The Celestic. Yeah, it's what they call the Halo car. Um, very expensive Rolls Royce competitor. Okay, so big luxury, huh? It's not really big. It's just. Um, is it your lyric just macked out with all yeah, the bells and whistles? Ex exactly. It is. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> so. And you're happy with the lyric? Things are going good? Oh, it's the nicest car we've ever owned. Yeah, but we're looking forward to um, access to the supercharger. And I already have an adapter that will be showing up, I think, tomorrow that will allow me to charge right away so I don't have to wait for the GM one. Okay. And uh, so very soon we should be charging on the supercharger. So with that being said, that's like one of the dynamics, you know, like GM coming out with that truck and the Silverado, it's doing really good. Uh, you know, they, the miles, uh, the huge battery, right, that was in the Hummer, they've kind of double proved decker battery. It. Yeah, that's right. They proved that it worked. Then they threw it in the Silverado. And I talked to uh, Jeremy, the guy that has one of the Hummers that are uh, – our EV group and me and him just talked the other day and he's like, Oh yeah, the Silverado aerodynamics was the difference. He says, if we would have done the same race with the Hummer, then the Cybertruck would have been the winner. Yeah. So he said it, that, that aerodynamics makes a big, a big enough difference. That's what gave GM the win, you know, with the out yeah. of specs. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. And if you're a guy looking for a truck or a lady looking for a truck, would you get a cyber truck for $120,000 or would you get a Silverado EV for 97,000 that goes further, has more features, yeah. and looks more like a truck? Yeah. You know, so Tesla definitely definitely has some um I'm on the fence for me. Uh, I'm on the fence. Um I like the look of the Hummer better. I really don't like the look of the of the 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 Silverado myself. See, I was an Avalanche so. fan. I love the way the Avalanche look. And right now the Silverado looks a lot like the Avalanche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess it's just, you know, what what our little clicks are. And then it's funny, you know, I like I I, I don't like all of Elon's crazy, but I watch uh um now you know Zach and Jesse. Do you ever watch yeah, them? I do. Yeah, great channel. So they break down Elon's tweets in the end of each one of their yep. episodes. Yep. And they kind of like so I and so I'm a, I'd have to say I'm more of a fan of Elon and the FU thing I thought was great. I loved it. <laughs> but I, then I hear you're you probably have a more realistic view. A lot of people, uh, if they're not watching Zach and Jesse, then a lot of his teeth tweets seem really off, off kilter and then the whole why did he buy x freeze you know it's just really aggressive stuff so i can see where you probably have a good point that we're losing the masses to those so that you know some of his yeah business so uh, yeah so they got a 10 percent staff reduction which really can't be ignored that likely on the next financial call uh there's not going to be more good news uh, from a global perspective. And I don't think we could discount the fact that they're getting their lunch eaten in China by BYD with uh, just churning out inexpensive cars for the masses and they're having a hard time selling their cars in other areas. BYD is moving all over the place. They're moving into Mexico. They're moving into Indonesia. They're moving into Singapore. Uh, there's talks of them going into India. And, you know, just making an inexpensive right. electric car from Chinese brand is, that's where they're losing out, I think. And, Right. I know I have no... a different I have a different perspective. So Jack, Zach and Jesse did a little bit of dig at least that's pretty much where I'm getting mine. Fars I listen to Fars out a little bit who used to work for mm -hmm. Tesla. And so both of their opinions are is Tesla's right where it needs to be. Like this 10% cut was as a company was really a smart move. And they're gonna be in better shape because they're doing it right now, right? Well, things mm -hmm. are kind of still going good. So it might it might be taken as a negative, but a year down the road, they're going to be so much better off by doing that. And that's one of Elon's strengths. And then Zach and Jesse did touch on the the numbers and they're down. But when you measure them, according to them, they were saying that all the ED sales are equally down, even BYD. So I, I, I guess from what they're saying, 
Well, you know, it's not, it's just across the board, right? And it's the high interest, right? It's harder to get loans. Well, BMW is doing very well with their EVs. Hyundai is doing very well with their EVs. As I mentioned, GM without the Volt are still doing well with the Silverado and the Lyric and the upcoming release of the Blazer. There's high demand for. So I do think yeah. there's other companies that are doing quite well in the EV segment. Ford's numbers are up with the Lightning and the uh, Mach-E. Um, so... Oh, okay. There, there's, wow. Um, it's, it's interesting, right? So it sounds like, well, you know, was, you're, what, what, where we're getting our data, it's, where's, you know, where's the, tr the truth, I guess. Well, I will say, say that GM and Ford have both, and Stellantis have all gone through reductions recently of staff without fanfare. You know, the news doesn't really like blow it up and say this is an apocalypse for the car industry. They're just cutting their staff. They're reorganizing. They're changing their engineering direction. They're doing that type of stuff. But when Tesla drops staff, all of a sudden it's a panic moment. But if GM, Ford, and Stellantis drop staff, which they've just recently done. In fact, Stellantis has just recently done it. And uh, there's a little bit of fanfare, but it wasn't at all like what's going on with Tesla. Tesla, they're talking about apocalypse for EVs. Uh, right now, isn't, that. isn't that what you're kind of talking about though where elon is ruffling everybody's feathers so he's basically got the u.s government you know and and the oil companies trying right trying to paint a bad picture for tesla just trying it, it, to make them look sensationalizing the reduction of staff i do think that is going on um so as you say it might just be a shrewd financial move uh or it might be indication of deeper problems I'm not an analyst. I can't really answer that, but it okay. is interesting to see. I do think that in general, the concept of EV adoption is without question increasing and yeah. will continue to increase right. as we continue to the March of uh, 2030, when we're said to be over 50% EV sales. That so, seems a little hopeful, right? I don't actually, I think it's a little conservative. So in Basically five years. I mean, we're almost halfway through this year. Six. Yeah. We'll, 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 so really, fifty percent. Well, that's not I mean, car, not that's not cars on the road. That would be sale of new vehicles. Yeah, I yeah. Fifty percent yeah. of EVs because and uh, just so you know, I only have two minutes left because I have a free Zoom account and I'm running it here oh. on mine. It was my mistake for doing that, but oh, okay, got no problem. I appreciate left. your help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. I do think that uh, Tony Saba's cost curve has been spot on. And right now we're in the mass adopt early part of the mass adoption phase where we'll be crossing 10% adoption rate uh, before the end of the year. And uh, trends, according to analysts, that are that will be over 10% by the close of the year and then on up to 15, 20, and 30% thereafter. So I do think the 50% by 2030 is a conservative number. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm excited about that. I, I'm with you as far as, even though I can work on cars, uh, I like my electric. Even with the Volt being the hybrid extended range, however you want to refer to it, plug-in electric hybrid. Uh, you know, I, I like that most of the time I'm electric, and it's a lot less work. It's a lot simpler. So I'm looking forward to converting completely. But uh, till then. Uh, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm expecting Carl and I will be back in the rhythm here. You know, he took the retirement and then went on this nice deserved motorcycle ride that he likes to do every year. So, yeah, uh, it's great to watch his videos getting posted of, uh, his trip down to, uh, uh, I, I guess he's going to Appalachia or something, but it's uh, really cool to watch and I appreciate you having me on and, um, put this together and I apologize. I had the free version of zoom, but, um, anyway, it was a great discussion and lots of cool things going on in the EV world now. Okay, great. We'll talk to you. All right.